Okay, welcome back. Late January 1855, and yeah, a bit of an unplanned break um, because, of course, uh, real world events. Who uh, are what times we live in? Um, and yeah, during the time that I would have sort of sat down uh, on my sort of last day off or uh, before that, perhaps, when I would have committed some time to sort of, you know, playing some sort of Pride of Nations sessioning, instead I was kind of glued to the news, probably like a lot of other people watching. Um, the craziness unfold um and yeah as such um there has been a bit of an unexpected break of a week or so and you know that from time to time that might well happen uh for, for reasons whether it be the impending threat of thermonuclear holocaust um or you know um personal strife or, or sort of work commitments or whatever but um i will always return we are only five years in to a 70-year campaign so a long way to go and um well, let's kick things off. Yeah, January 1855. Um, I'll, uh, I'll walk you through the kind of running, kind of low, low intensity conflicts that we have there. And of course, the the the, uh, the one that's been running for some time um, has been in Yemen. We have two commanders in theatre now: uh, Zarif Pasha, in command of an infantry division, and his junior two-star uh, general Ismail Pasha, with really what is two marine brigades, but actually a, a marine division, really in total, um, a cavalry division plus. A support militia brigade now they were looking to achieve some kind of force concentration in Taiz, which they did successfully in order to lift the siege on sana now i should report that sana did fall albeit very briefly ismail pasha moved into sana immediately after it fell forced the issue and the really good thing here is what we are seeing is pitched battles where the Yemenis are being defeated wholesale, uh, which is a new development. What tended to happen is they would inflict fairly, fairly heavy casualties on us, they'd break off, we'd be kind of like chasing them, the, them around. We're engaging them in fairly kind of sizable pitched battles now. It looks like the force around Sana actually evaporated. Um, Zarif Pasha moved from uh, Taiz into Hadramut, uh, chasing uh, the remnants really of the force that fell back from Sana, and we seem to have kind of... Um, Seems to have done well there. Of course, you know, uh, <laughs> you're, so, you're hopping from foot to foot in a place like Yemen. Um, as we move north, uh, Yemeni forces from, I guess, uh, Mukalla have moved in and is now besieging the large fortress that we have built up in Aden. And we have uh, fairly substantial forces there, um, but we do, you know, we don't want to leave that being besieged for a long period of time. The downside to Sana falling is even though we still have the depot and all this sort of thing, a lot of the colonial buildings we've lost. We've lost the colonial fortress, which is obviously torched. Uh, we also lost our trade post and this sort of thing. So it's, uh, you know, it's at a certain point, you do start wondering how cost effective this, this conflict is. But also, you know, we're committed. And I think we're going to have to kind of, uh, we're going to have to press on. And we are starting to see results in the field now, concrete results. So we will press on. Neither of these commanders are activated, first of uh, uh, well, And also, they've both just come off the back of, uh, of sort of fairly kind of sustained action so for the time being they're going to hold their positions in Hadrabat and Sana and then hopefully next turn or perhaps looking into February we'll be looking to move south to lift the siege on Aden that's pretty much the situation um, in the kind of Aden insurgency we should report also that there have been some sort of low level insurgencies in sort of um, uh, sort of Mesopotamia just the northern part of the Arabian Peninsula these are very very kind of small forces very modest forces we're talking you know, hundreds of men at a time. Uh, we sent the, uh, well, at one point we had to release the Baghdad division um, to move to Rudbar um, and uh, deal with uh, an insurgent force there. They did that successfully. Another force seems to have moved up and is actually was for a brief period besieging um, Damascus, which was somewhat alarming. Uh, we had a division in theater anyway because we were looking to kind of try and uh, sort of secure really the shoulder um, near the Sinai that goes into um our protectorate in hajez so we had it we had a division in place it, it doesn't have a kind of dedicated command staff it just has kind of its own localized commanders um but that is more than sufficient to kind of seal the deal we in fact engaged the rebels besieging um damascus we didn't inflict any casualties they inflicted a thousand casualties on us but we have fairly substantial forces so they you know uh, hit and run sort of guerrilla style warfare but at the very least what with this force present there's no real prospect of damascus falling libya all quiet which is good to see and libya of course is a formal colony now uh, so no major dramas no issues or complaints there we have kind of forces uh, guarding benghazi tobruk and tripoli to ensure um continued security um in the colony now on to the economy um I, I think that's it oh no there is another military development of course there um i sort of mentioned 
in November last year um, that I was considering maybe kind of, you know, we are technically at war with Venezuela because we have to fulfill the guarantee that we extend it to Britain and declare war on Venezuela or else face serious prestige loss. And also, um, this you know, this wouldn't have been, this wouldn't have gone down very well in London. And we want to try and keep the British on, on um, you know, we want to try and stay in their good books. So our newly min uh, minted, Two-star general Osman Pasha in command of an entire infantry corps, uh, which we've released. This is actually the reserve infantry corps that we had, uh, commanded by Ritsa Pasha, who's also in command of a garrison or a mixed force. He's in command of a mixed force in Constantinople, kind of our reserve force. We released and um, transported across the Atlantic, and we've landed at Caracas. Um, he's activated. We are absolutely going to force the issue and seek to take Caracas. Now, this does seem like crazy sort of pie in the sky stuff it's like you know what an ottoman army in venezuela you know get real not at all um the, the ottomans as i mentioned in the last video they sent an expeditionary force to uh in well in the uh, mexican civil war in the 1860s it was a very small very very modest force indeed it was probably much smaller than an army corps i would imagine it would have been a very small contingent probably of a few hundred men but we don't intend to replicate the kind of uh, decaying completely weak and enfeebled ottoman empire we want to uh, be a bit more proactive on the world stage now we don't want to go too crazy uh, and upset anyone um but we are you know we do have british allies there's a british battle squadron there we sit we sent our kind of raiding fleet not actually to conduct any kind of commerce raiding i don't think venice i mean venice caracas doesn't even have a port i think there might be a port in uh, I guess that it has one port but it has no navy to speak of it has no presence in the trade boxes so the venezuelans at this stage don't have any kind of merchant fleet but the idea is if we kind of intervene decisively take caracas and bear in mind that these you know caracas is not even a fortress it's just a town with a garrison and we have an army corps of you know shade under 30 or 25,000 men the hope is that's going to be sufficient to take caracas caracas is the capital city of venezuela it's the only victory location and the idea is that we make our own peace in the most favorable terms, see if we can get some concessions, see if we can squeeze the Venezuelans for a bit of cash. Sort of free money, really, you know. Um, in terms of the transport fleet, uh, we had to break that off from the Riverine transport uh, detachment. A bit confusing, because the, we also use Riverine points sometimes, which is basically utilizing merchant and, and um, port capacity to move forces. But we also had a dedicated um, Riverine transport back in Constantinople. That obviously could only move along coastal regions and up rivers. It would not be able to move across the Atlantic. But the transport capacity we had in a larger transport force um, was sufficient. Uh, we had a lift capacity of 40. This Army Corps uh, requires 40, so ex exactly the, the right amount of kind of transport capacity. That was enough to lift that Army Corps over to Caracas. The hope is we don't become embroiled in some daft embarrassment here. But my thinking is, let's press the issue. We've got a good junior commander, Osman Pasha, at the helm and uh yeah we're gonna see if we can kind of just get something out of it you know it sort of uh, it imposes uh, imposes us a little bit on the world stage it w might be quite surprising to many nations but then i think a lot of nations would have been sort of surprised by our performance in the crimean war we really held our own you know and uh it was it was certainly getting dicey towards the end um but i think you know the russians are a run a run from their money and next time round, of course we intend to do a lot better than that next turn of the circle we don't really want to be fighting protracted warfare in the Balkan Peninsula, just you know, damaging our kind of economy and this sort of thing. And to that end, of course, we have a fortress being built at Constanta. We are going to begin to firm up and improve the fortification system that we have in the Balkans to make this area really kind of calcified, you know, like a kind of um, sort of like stepping on a hedgehog. In the east, we just completed the. Um, we just completed the building of, uh, well, increasing the size of our depot in the east at Ezerum, actually. And we're going to continue to do that. We're going to continue to sort of develop fortifications in this area. We do have limited state revenue at the moment. Every fortnight, of course, we are plowing 50 state revenue into uh, a particular technology branch, which is percussion, percussion cap muskets are at 90% progress. Now, you can now see the gradual progress of state revenue being ploughed into this particular research field. This is important because it's a qualitative kind of leap in terms of weapons and, and also just the, uh, it's it's not just, I mean, it's kind of percussion cut muskets, but with this really comes a raft of military reforms, which are really important. It, it leads to, uh, well, it leads to 28 new kinds of units being available in our force pool. It's like when people talk about kind of modern day aircraft and combat equipment, they talk about second or third generation. This is kind of the 19th century equivalent to that, really. It's the next generation of infantry combat soldier. 
And even though we have a kind of, you know, um, the Nazi Melchior Deed is a kind of Europeanized army or Western Europeanized army, uh, it's still lagging behind our competitors. And Russia has a similar kind of backwardness to we that, to, to what we experience at the moment. That won't always be the case. Russia, you know, uh, will sort of, um, uh, will, will, you know, uh, eventually also be looking at kind of the next generation of infantry soldier. And the other foe that we could be looking at, of course, Austria, will be a terribly advanced power to fight. It will be a, a different ball game fighting um, Austria to Russia. Counterintuitively, because you think that Russia is, is a more powerful country. It is, but Austria has is much more compact. You know, it's uh, it's got a really nice integrated rail system reasonably so anyway which means they could redeploy troops relatively quickly into sort of hungary and i would probably suggest as well that their staff commanders are for the most part more capable characters they're less amateurish uh, so we want to make sure that you know we don't really be relying on these sort of general lee type figures uh you know um in, you know good leadership is important omar pasha uh, we've got hussein avni now as well um but we want more than that Frankly, you know, we don't want to rely on these figures. If one of them gets nailed in a particular battle, then it's kind of game over, and that, that's not a good way to fight a war. So, that's the kind of military part of the report. In terms of our economic report, um, things are continuing to go well. We look in terms of manufactured goods now. We're starting to see the kind of global market biting a little bit. You know, we, we sold we sold ten manufactured goods just this last uh, term, this last fortnight. Ten units of manufactured goods to France, eight to Britain five to austria and that continues to climb tobacco is fairly consistent at the moment the basis really for explosive tobacco exports is going to be railroads railroads the first railroads going to be built in constantinople the second the, initially they're, they're going to be very localized railroads constantinople smyrna smyrna incidentally is increasing in size these areas of intense industrial development will create intensive population growth as people flood into these cities looking for work and, and this sort of thing um but yeah, Constantinople, Smyrna, but then also we want to extend um, a long strategic railway from Constantinople, Adrianople, uh, Kavala into Salonika. And this, of course, is the tobacco belt, if you like. It, it, it's not the only tobacco region. We also have Pleven up here, but this is the area of the most intensive tobacco production. And a railroad linking this area, cutting right through, through here, would, would dramatically increase uh, tobacco production and tobacco is something that we'll export so um, that's going to be the kind of very broadly the kind of plan for railway development when it becomes available and from that we'll see really nice yields in terms of um, in terms of exports other exports <coughs> again we're seeing real dividends uh, from that kind of early agricultural development you know the early agricultural revolution and, and like um, the thing to the thing to keep in mind here now is that sort of five years into the game the economy is increasingly rooted in capitalist mode of production. I mean, if we're looking at structures production, that is capitalist manufacturers, if you like, RGOs, 12 units, um, and craft production, 9. That's just of cereals, you know, fish, um, structure production sits at 14, craft production is 6. Uh, so, you know, across the board now, we're seeing sort of um, the old kind of guild based economy. Uh, we've got structures production, manufactured goods at 10. And okay, 11, 11 craft production, but that will soon be eclipsed, especially with railways. But yeah, we're seeing the kind of old, early modern uh, economy of the guilds being gradually eclipsed now. I would probably suggest that in January 1850, only five years ago, you know, 90% of our economy, probably more, was rooted in the kind of craft production. It was dependent on that kind of guild based economy. 1855. I'd say that, that probably three quarters of our economy is now based, you know, um, is, is based on RGOs and modern capitalist manufacturers. Uh, that's, that's a massive kind of qualitative leap. And we, we can see this in, in two areas. One, we can see um, uh, increased, I mean, increased sales on the domestic market, which is gradually yielding slightly less private capital. That's going to be based on things like price fluctuation, greater availability and stuff like that. Um, fairly fairly consistent sort of sales um, are in our colonies, although with slightly increased private capital yields. But the main thing, of course, is we're now looking at exports, uh, the value of exports exceeding um, the revenue generated on the basis of national market sales. And you've got to bear in mind that all of these transactions, whether it's exports, national market sales, colonial sales they all generate tax revenue as well in different ways you know like um export and imports and this kind of thing we, we kind of get revenue from tariffs so there's a kind of you know there's a complex kind of tax system in place that allows us to net a really nice kind of um you know really really nice amounts of, of, of state revenue 
uh, from this. What, I mean, like uh, I think someone mentioned in one of the comments from a previous video, like uh, one important thing for kind of increasing domestic uh, demand is going to be based on, on Academy of Sciences and Technology. And those are going to be kind of theoretical developments that essentially centralize the point of exchange. One feature of the Industrial Revolution, of course, is centralizing the, the means of production. The other part of it for domestic market sales is going to be centralizing and rationalizing distribution of exchange. And that's going to become with sort of big shops and, and this sort of thing. And that, that that's something that, that will be developed during this period as well. So that will allow us to uh, that will allow us to see increased domestic market sales. But the economy for the most part, just yeah, despite the fact that we still don't have railroads, is now increasingly rooted in the Industrial Revolution. And on the back of that, railroads Will, will follow very quickly and railroads is the next qualitatively brilliant that's it for the most part um, in terms of foreign policy one thing that I have noticed is the Austrians uh, reached out to us uh, they've organized a state visit which we um, accepted and also Egypt um, our f uh, the former um, uh, yeah the former colonial province really Ayelet of Egypt um, organized a state visit we don't see any reason not to do that that's fine you know we don't have any ambitions I mean for Christ's sake most of most of our kind of um, most of our uh, agricultural resources, even in our empire, are not even exploited. Um, so, on a capitalist basis, we don't have any reason to kind of expand. It's not like you know, uh, we, you know it's not like we, we're moving into a kind of an imperialist stage. Where we need to try and find new markets or anything like that. The reality is, this would just be a prestige thing. It would damage, you know, it would damage our kind of morale. You know, it would damage our kind of relations with other countries and things like this. And we don't have any territorial claims, so we would have to forcefully occupy Egypt. Something that's not on the cards. And something that, yeah, that we don't want to do. We, we're principally a defensive power, really. But we want to hold on to the gains that we have, our kind of legacy territories, and, and uh, develop our economy. That's going to be it for January 1855. Again, apologies for the length of time for anyone that is, you know, is is really interested in the campaign and, and that has been following it. And it's great that people have been. Um, but yeah, it's it, it, it it's a game that I'm always going to come back to. This campaign will go on, you know, save for me popping my clogs, thermonuclear holocaust, um, or or any other kind of reason, my computer spectacularly dying or something like that. But it'll be a campaign that will always be returned to. I'll try and get a, um, a load of videos uploaded this week. Do do a bit of a kind of session this evening, so I'll get some videos kind of prepared um but yeah we'll leave it here uh, for january 1855 first well next quarterly report will be sort of um march april time this year and again we'll do sort of you know quarterly reports uh going through into 1856 so thanks for watching this video and i'll see you in the next one